The chief advantage of the submarine in warfare is stealth. Their ability to approach a target and strike without detection was originally considered unfair by professional naval officers. Naval officers considered them ungentlemanly up to and during the First World War. Since then, their operators have become ever more stealthy, and they can operate in all of the world's oceans, along and within coastal waters and estuaries, unseen and unheard. Submarines are not limited to striking enemy shipping. Cruise missiles and ballistic missiles allow them to attack targets on land as well as at sea. They can also deliver troops and intelligence agents conduct covert surveillance, lay mines and plant listening devices, and deploy divers for diverse missions. They can operate beneath the polar ice, and many have been built with the ability to surface through the ice cap. With each passing year, they become more difficult to detect and track. They have become so deadly that anti-submarine warfare is the primary mission of all the navies in the world. Submarines have completed some of the most stunning operations in the history of warfare, including during the Cold War. In the video today, 10 Amazing Uses of Submarines in warfare. Number 10. Operation Pistorius In 1942, with the direct approval of Hitler, the German Abwehr and Navy launched Operation Pistorius. The operation delivered trained saboteurs, all former residents of the United States, to American shores. They planned the destruction of American infrastructure, including railroad yards and stations, dams, warehouses, docks and wharves, and targets of opportunity. It fell to German submarine commanders to get the teams into the United States. Two U-boats sailed to the American coast, evaded U.S. Navy and Coast Guard anti-submarine patrols, and stealthily crept to within a stone's throw of the land. U-201's commander saw the lights of traffic and heard the sounds of Long Island as he deployed his team. He then ran aground. As the dawn broke, he could see the coastline clearly, though he remained undetected as he strained to free his U-boat from the coastal mark off Long Island. He succeeded, and with the rising sun in his eyes, he managed to sail away unseen. A second U-boat, dispatched to the Florida coast, enjoyed similar success. The agents, though, were captured after one turned himself into the FBI. All but two were executed as spies. Operation Pistorius failed, but demonstrated the ability of German submarines to land similar operations in the United States and Canada, relying on the professionalism and skills of their submarine commanders and crews. Number 9. Entering Enemy Harbors and Anchorages World War I demonstrated the necessity of protecting fleet anchorages and harbors from submarine incursions. The Royal Navy's main fleet anchorage at Scapa Flow in the Orkneys gained protection from submarine nets pulled across the shipping channels by fleet tugs, effectively closing a gate for the harbor. Naval mines floated outside the main shipping channels. Block ships acted to seal off less used channels into the harbor. Yet the German Navy decided to strike the British fleet as it lay at anchor. U-boat U-47 under Gunther Prien moved to attack the anchorage just after midnight on October 14, 1939. He entered the harbor on the surface by carefully slipping past two anchored block ships, only to find the British fleet was for the most part not there. He did find the World War I era HMS Royal Oak, a veteran at the Battle of Jutland. Prien fired a salvo of three torpedoes, only one of which struck its target and exploded. Incredibly, the crew of the battleship and the other guard ships and sentries in the anchorage did not detect the German submarine. Aboard the Royal Oak, the crew assumed the explosion occurred in the forward flammable storeroom. While the British inspected their ship, Prien calmly reloaded his torpedo tubes, fired another salvo, and three torpedoes struck the battleship. It sunk quickly with a heavy loss of life. Prien escaped via the way he came in to a hero's welcome in Germany, having demonstrated the striking power of the modern submarine. Number 8. Espionage Operation Mincemeat contains the drama and suspense of a James Bond story, which is unsurprising since Ian Fleming, Bond's creator, suggested a similar ploy in 1941. The goal of the operation was to convince the German High Command the upcoming invasion of Sicily was a mere feint, with the real invasion aimed at Sardinia and Greece. A recently deceased Welsh tramp was dressed in a Royal Marine officer's uniform, equipped with personal items including love letters and photographs of a fictional girlfriend. He was given fake identity papers with the name William Martin and a briefcase which had official correspondence within it that contained deception meant for the Germans. To deliver the corpse where the Germans would find it, the mincemeat planners turned to the Royal Navy, which transported it via submarine. HMS Seraph's crew were told the canister, which contains the body, was a top-secret weather monitoring device to be launched near the Spanish coast. Seraph arrived at the designated point and conducted one of the strangest covert operations ever performed by a submarine. The ship surfaced, the canister brought on deck, and all the crew, except officers, were ordered below. The officers dropped the body into the water, and the submarine's screws created a wash, driving it towards the shore. 
A fisherman found the body, which was turned over to the authorities, who determined that the man had drowned. The body was then released to the British for a funeral. Spanish authorities retained the briefcase containing the false papers, photographed them, and delivered the copies to the Abwehr. Mincemeat had worked to perfection. Number 7. Refueling Aircraft The Japanese Navy plans long-range bombing raids early in World War II using Kawanishi H-8K flying boats. Planners considered bombing missions to targets in Washington, Oregon, California, and the Panama Canal. None of the targets could be reached from Japan's forward-most Pacific bases. The airplanes required refueling to complete the missions. The Japanese Navy had a solution to the problem, though. The new airplanes would rendezvous at a predetermined time with tanker submarines for refueling. French frigate Shoals and atoll to the northwest of Hawaii was selected as the rendezvous. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the mission changed to one of monitoring repairs at the American base and harassing them whenever possible. The Japanese called the plan Operation K. American codebreakers learned of Operation K and informed senior officers who ignored them. The Japanese executed the plan just once, refueling the planes at French frigate Shoals by tanker submarine. After the demonstration of the Japanese ability to refuel airplanes from submarines, American warships took up picket duties near the atoll. Japanese tanker submarines operated throughout the war, including delivering oil and fuel to bases beleaguered by Allied air attacks. Another operation, similar to Operation K, planned to determine the whereabouts of American aircraft carriers, failed in May 1942 due to increased U.S. Navy diligence at the rendezvous point. The Japanese also built large tanker submarines to ship oil from the East Indies to the home islands, but the war ended before they came into extensive use. Number 6. Submarines Resupplying Submarines When World War II began, the German Navy had several supply and refueling ships at sea placed to service at service raiders and submarines. Beginning in 1940, German ship yards built Type 14 U-boats, designed to refuel and resupply their fellow U-boats at sea, allowing the latter to remain on patrol for longer periods. The Type 15 reduced the periods of greatest risk for the German U-boats, entering or leaving port. The German submariners named the Type 14 the Milk Cows. Milk Cows carried more than just fuel, they delivered torpedoes, lubricants, and food, including fresh bread baked on board in bakeries designed for the purpose. Other than anti-aircraft machine guns, Milk Cows had no means of defense. They lacked deck guns and spaces for torpedo tubes on smaller submarines accommodated refrigerated storage space. Service in a milk cow was dangerous, as the Allies recognized that sinking these supply submarines curtailed the operations of the attack submarines. The Germans completed 10 Type 14 submarines during the war out of a planned 24, losing them all to Allied actions. The milk cows were, in essence, submersible submarine tenders, though both the Type 14 and the U-boat under resupply needed to surface to transfer materials. While on the surface, both were at their most vulnerable. Today, submarines use remotely controlled vehicles to exchange material and personnel while remaining submerged. Number 5. Covert Delivery In early 1942, American and Philippine forces on Corregidor faced shortages of nearly everything needed to wage war. In particular, mechanically fused anti-aircraft shells to combat high-level Japanese bombers were in short supply. USS Trout departed Pearl Harbor in January 1942, carrying 3,500 rounds of 3-inch anti-aircraft ammunition stored anywhere on the submarines where space was found. To make more room, the only torpedoes carried on board were those found in the tubes. Trout delivered the ammunition to Corregidor, docking at night and unloading the cargo by hand. Simultaneously, the submarine took on torpedoes. One once the cargo was unloaded, it became apparent that ballast was needed to maintain the submarine's sea-keeping ability. It received ballast, also loaded by the crew passing it hand-to-hand. -hand. Trout received 20 tons of ballast in the form of gold bars and sacks of silver pesos. The wealth of the Philippines. The crew passed the gold bars, which weighed approximately 40 pounds apiece to each other, and stowed them wherever they could. The silver pesos arrived at the pier in 630 sacks, each containing 1,000 coins, each valued at about 50 American cents at the time. Just before dawn, the submarine left the pier and spent the day sitting on the bottom of Manila Bay. That night, it returned to the pier, loaded additional securities, checks, official mail, and cash, and departed from the Philippines. It completed its war patrol, sinking two Japanese ships while laden with gold and silver. Trout returned to Pearl Harbor in March, where the treasure carried by the submarine was turned over to the Treasury. Not a single coin was missing. Number 4. Hit and Run Land Raids American Marines going ashore on Japanese-held islands usually deployed from landing craft designed 
and built for the purpose. For the Mackin Island raid in 1942, they deployed from submarines. Ordinarily, a submarine offers little elbow room for its crew, with every available space crowded with men, equipment, and food. For Mackin Island, two American submarines, the USS Argonaut and USS Nautilus, carried just over 200 US Marines known as Carlson's Raiders. They deployed them using rubber boats powered by outboard motors. While the raid was conducted, the submarines supported the Marines using their deck and anti-aircraft guns. The Japanese counterattacked with aircraft, and both submarines were forced to submerge to escape air attacks. They then evacuated the surviving Marines and wounded, though nine were captured and eventually executed. The Mackin Island Raid, an early example of landing combat troops using submarines, failed to achieve its major objective of gaining intelligence from prisoners, but it demonstrated the ability of submarines to deliver combat troops with little or no warning, achieving complete surprise. Modern submarines of all major navies retain the ability in the 21st century, working with special underwater equipment to deploy special forces. Number 3. Supporting Guerrilla Operations After the surrender of American forces in the Philippines in 1942, Philippine guerrillas continued to operate against Japanese troops throughout the archipelago. In some cases, American troops evaded capture and fought alongside them. To support them, American submarines delivered supplies, clothing, ammunition, weapons, and coordinated plans for airstrikes and espionage operations. They also provided aid to coast watchers in the Philippines who reported Japanese movements and monitored the activity of troops. In January 1943, USS Gudgeon delivered 2,000 pounds of supplies and eight American volunteers. USS Tambor followed in March, delivering supplies and men. After Tambor's mission, submarines visited the Philippines on an average of once every five weeks. The incursions required considerable skill from the submarines, threading their way through the islands in the dark, landing supplies under the noses of the Japanese. They also evacuated the wounded whenever possible and moved guerrilla units around the islands. Four submarines were removed from normal war patrol duties and designated as guerrilla support ships. The guerrilla campaign against the Japanese in the Philippines continued through the end of the war, with submarines enabling the resistance up until the surrender of the Japanese in Tokyo Bay. Number 2. Spying on Communications American nuclear submarines came into their own during the Cold War. They monitored Soviet submarines, tracking them at sea, and avoided detection by by the enemy. The sea-based leg of the American nuclear triad operated from American missile submarines, beginning with Polaris and evolving into Trident II. They also conducted covert spying operations, monitoring communications within the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact nations. One of the most successful, Operation Ivy Bells, involved tapping undersea communication cables within Soviet territorial waters. Submarines, including USS Parsh and USS Halibut, carried divers to a site along the cable, where a tap was installed which had the capability to record conversations on the line, which were considered to be secure by the Soviets. Ivy Bells involved the American CIA, NSA, and US Navy. The tapped cable ran between the Soviet Pacific Fleet's main base to its headquarters at Vladivostok. Submarines visited the tap on a regular basis, obtaining the recordings and replacing them with new tapes. The missions were dangerous physically and politically. The submarines involved were prepared to self-destruct rather than be trapped by the Soviets. Ronald Pelton, an analyst for the NSA for over 40 years, informed the Soviets of the program after resigning from the US government. He received $5,000 from the Soviets for the information regarding Ivy Bells, endangering the submariners involved in the then ongoing operation. In 1981, Parsh visited the site of the tap but failed to find the device. Today, it is on display in a Russian museum in Moscow. Number 1. Attacking targets on land The US Navy fired a little more than 800 Tomahawk cruise missiles during Operation Iraqi Freedom, with about one third of them launched from submarines operating in the Arabian Gulf and the Red Sea. One American submarine involved in the operation to remove Saddam Saddam Hussein from power, USS Louisville, participated in Operation Desert Storm in 1991. During Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Louisville raced submerged from Pearl Harbor to the Red Sea, 14,000 miles across the Pacific and Indian Oceans, to launch the first submarine cruise missile strikes in history. Desert Storm demonstrated submarines can and do strike anywhere from all the oceans of the world while remaining virtually undetected. Today's submarines gather intelligence, disrupt communications, threaten the sea lanes, seal the harbors and ports of enemy nations and deploy troops, agents, and special operations teams. They defend themselves from enemy missiles, torpedoes, mines, and airborne attacks. In war games, American fast attack submarines demonstrated the ability to take on alone an entire carrier-based task force and destroy it piecemeal. They can and have circumnavigated the globe submerged and traveled from the Pacific to the Atlantic under the polar ice. 
Few weapons in any nation's defense arsenal are as versatile, reliable, and deadly to the enemy. The missions they've undertaken include some of the most amazing in history, and there are no doubt similar operations underway around the globe this very moment. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, why not check out another channel I do called Geographics? I'm going to link to that below. And thank you for watching.